thank you so much for all of your messages. Um, I can see tuning in tonight for this very special tour of Paris with a focus on the great women of past and present. There are many women among you and you're tuning in from all parts of the world. Just give me one second uh, to kick off the um, YouTube live and during our tour, tonight you feel free please to ask me if any point you have a question uh, in the chat uh, or for those of you who are watching this tour live streaming from youtube um, i will be also checking the messages on youtube chat so um, throughout our time together i'll probably be focusing on presenting the tour which is probably going to be around an hour and a half and towards the end we'll have some time for questions and answers. So I see that um, you are you're coming from, let's see, uh, many of you are from the States and I can see that many of you have been to Paris before. Just see where is the chat here again? Here, yes. And um, just a little bit about myself. So some of you may know me. <clears throat> My name is Josephine. It's really easy to remember. You can simply think of me as the great Empress Josephine reincarnated in Chinese blood 200 years later. I'm originally from Hong Kong, uh, but I quit my teaching job back in 2010. I came to Paris. I fell in love with the city, fell in love with a man. We got married whirlwind style two months after we met and the rest is history. So we're still happily married. It's been seven years. We both happen to be tour guides in Paris. And since the pandemic, we have launched this, uh, um, our virtual activities uh, called Paris and Beyond Tours. And uh, for the last five weeks, we are trying to connect with you guys who've been to Paris, who love Paris, and so that we can keep sharing our passion and keep bringing you back to Paris virtually. So today, um, I thought I wanted to talk about Paris and some of the lesser told stories of um, the anecdotes, the sides of the landmarks, monuments that we know so well, uh, but some of those are rather forgotten, um, lesser told stories that focus on the great women and their contribution to France. Um, so we're going to do it in a, a chronological way. We're going to start from the birth of the city to the future of Paris. So this is why quite a lot to cover, more than 2000 years of history. So an hour and a half here. So feel free again uh, to let me know uh, your thoughts, your questions at the end. So throughout our time together, I also have prepared some poll questions. So we're going to try our first one. Here we go. What do you think is the most visited monument in Paris? Is the Eiffel Tower, the Notre Dame Cathedral or the Louvre Museum? And my tip for you is that it's a free monument. You don't need to even pay to get in. And I think my my presentation screen is giving you a good tip, isn't it? Of course, it is the Notre Dame Cathedral, Our Lady Cathedral, dedicated to Virgin Mary. It's situated on this island called Ile de la Cité. And on the eastern part, eastern tip of the island here, on the Seine River here. So let me see here. Um, if you just so you know that I'm going to temporarily close up the chat box uh, and I will review the box regularly. So to see uh, if you have any questions. And uh, here we go. Um, yes, there's about 13 million visitors. Oops, it's getting ahead of myself. There's about 13 million visitors a year to the Notre Dame Cathedral, of course, before the fire, and um, about uh, 50,000 on average a day that goes in and worship this masterpiece of Gothic architecture, but only a few of them know about this mark. Tell me if you guys have noticed it before. Maybe you have even thrown a coin. Maybe you have even walked around it twice and made a wish. So um, this is called the point zero. It's really just a few steps away from the entrance way to the Notre Dame Cathedral. Why is it called point zero? Because it literally means that all the roads in France to anywhere else is measured from this point. So this is really the starting point of any traveling distances in France. So of course, the story of Paris also begins right here, point zero. So let's go back very much uh, to the very beginning of 2,250 years ago. Well, what do you think is the reason why the city is called Paris? Is it because of the Romans, the Vikings, or the Gauls who gave us the name of the city here? Let me see what your thoughts are. 
And there we go for your poll question. Well, at the very beginning, we had a tribe. This was a tribe that belonged to the Celts. Uh, and um, they had a very cute name called the Parisi. The Parisi uh, makes me think of usually obelisk or asterisk. You know, we actually have a great uh, obelisk, um, asterisk park, uh, uh, just an hour drive away from Paris. So these were the first known settlement that we know who settled conveniently on the island, Ile de la Cité, island of the city. Why? because it is surrounded by water, which offered great protection. The water river used to be twice wide and they went fishing in the water and the water, um, they also worshiped the water, the deities in the water. And um, this is how, because of trading on the water, it also made the settlement a very prosperous one. So this happy life did not go for a long time. About 200 years later, this very ambitious, uh, uh, Roman uh, by the name Julius Caesar, who brought me my favorite salad, Julius Caesar salad. And also thanks to him, I had the Caesarian. So I really don't complain about his achievement, but he defeated the Gauls. He defeated those united Celtic tribes under the leadership of Vercingetorix. And this is how, right from 52 BC, Paris became part of the vast Roman Empire. For the next few hundred years, the Gauls, the Parises, and the Romans is going to mix. And uh, under the Roman time, Paris was really known as Lutes or Lutetia, which translates to swampy land or mud. mud. You can imagine when it rains or when the water floods, right? The, the, the island, which was not paved, becomes very swampy. Therefore, Lutes becomes the name of hotels, restaurants, bars all over Paris. We have streets, squares everywhere named Lutes. So for those about 500 years, um, so the Romans spilled in their population and they had to move away from this island that's protected by water naturally onto the hill, the natural hill, which we call the left bank. Uh, this is because of the water direction it flows from east to west uh, from Dijon all the way to English Channel. And this is how uh, going down the stream, you would have the hill St. Genevieve on your left hand side. Today, the left bank is what we know as the Latin Quarter St. Germain. So they spilled onto the left bank. And in the present Saint, uh, Latin Quarter, they had built uh, this very fully functional Roman city with forums. You see the very large square and arena, this round shaped, and a, a few bathhouses, and as well as the major road. So they actually left the city in the center, a uh, sacred place on the eastern part uh, where my red circle shows. This is where they built temples dedicated to their important Roman gods like Jupiter. So on the western part where the secular power lies, they built palaces for the Roman governors. So this is how the division of the island started from the very beginning, from the Roman era. Now the Romans started basically collapsing uh, around the fourth century. The Visigoths, the Vandals, the, well, they started uh, uh, crossing the Rhine River. They started pushing uh, the Gauls further and further away to the west. So as the empire was collapsing, the worst enemy appeared over the horizon from the east. These were the Huns. If you don't know who Attila the Hun is, uh, uh, this is this movie from um, Museum Night by Ben Stiller, that the guy with the club chasing after Ben Stiller, that is Attila the Hun. So Attila the Hun was the worst enemy you can imagine for all of the Europeans at the 451. Uh, he came from a Mong Mongol area in, uh, eastern, uh, in eastern China, and um, with his ferocious army, uh, they looted, pillaged, killed, raped, all kinds of uh, um, audacious things. And um, it is said they were on their way, they were walking, marching on Paris in the year 451. So the Parisians heard this uh, news and they were preparing to abandon their, their city like so many other have done. So at this moment, who do you think appeared and saved the Parisians from leaving their own homes? Let me show you the next poll question. 
Did I say, okay, here we go. Who is it that saved Paris from destruction, right? Of course, it is a woman hero, heroine by the name Genevieve. And Genevieve is the patron saint of Paris. You can see her story represented on the facade of the Notre Dame on the very left portal here. So um, I would, I will tell you the story of Gen Saint Genevieve, which is actually represented in many monuments in Paris. Uh, but I will tell you particularly from the help from this monument Pantheon. So Pantheon was actually built uh, originally as Church Saint Genevieve by one of our kings, but Napoleon had it converted into a temple for uh, for, for the Republic. And so this is where today about 78 great French celebrities, scientists, politicians, they are laid to rest in peace inside the Pantheon Crypt. So the necropolis of the great French man, uh, but originally it was actually built as a church in the name of Saint Genevieve. So if you go inside the Pantheon, you can see those huge walls that surround you actually tells you the story of our Saint Genevieve here. So let me start with one side here. Um, she was born um, in Nanterre about the year 421. She comes from this rather wealthy aristocrat family, this Roman Gallo family. Uh, her father holds office the in the municipal office. And uh, from a very young age, she already started to show that she was a very strong-willed girl and she was very devoted to religion, to God. And she made a choice very early on to go into uh, a, a life uh, of, of a veil. And her choice was supported by the bishop. Um, so at 19 years old, she she took up the veil, and soon after that, after the death of her parents, she moved from Nanterre to Paris. She inherited the wealthy land. She also inherited his, her, her father's office, and she became one of the council members that would sit uh, in office, and they would uh, discuss and um, uh, offer um, advice and um, uh, legal power to, to all things concerning Paris. So she um, would redistribute her wealth. She had a lot of income from her land, but she would actually give away most of her wealth to the poor. She herself would be very often fasting. She would be eating only once or twice a week and living on very simple uh, bread and water. And um, she, then uh, when Attila the Hun arrived in 451, she was about 27 years old. So you can see on the other side of the Pantheon wall, we have this three set friezes telling us the story of Attila the Hun. The very first one that shows you the army is watching, was marching on Paris. The second scene shows you the men in Paris. They're starting to get ready. They're getting nervous. They want to, they're packing up their stuff. They're getting their carriages ready to leave their city uh, unprotected. And Genevieve, well, goes to calm the crowds and tells people that all you need to do is to stay calm, yes, and pray, right? Because I know, I know that God will protect you. So, but you can see uh, most of the men, right? They're holding a rock in their hands. They're preparing to throw the rocks at Genevieve because they really didn't believe her. They thought she was crazy. They thought she was telling false prophecy. But Genevieve, very brave, ignored all of them. Right? So even they were hostile. She said, let the men flee if they want. If they're no longer able to fight, we women will pray to God as much as long as he hears us our pleas. What she did was that she organized a group of women and nuns, and they hosted a week-long prayer marathon. Day and night, um, they would always be praying with a light, with a torch on. And the legend says that the demon keeps on blowing out the fire of the torch, while later on, the angel would help to reunite the fire. Uh, we don't really know what went um, uh, on on the side of um, Attila, but uh, well, last minute what happened, uh, Attila decided he wasn't coming to Paris anymore. So literally at the edge of the city on the eastern side, he turned around, went south to Orleans. And it was there in Orleans, so he would later uh, be defeated at the Battle of Chalon, and he would retreat back to Ryan and never cross 
the Ryan and never came to Gaul again. And the next year, he actually died. So this is why we credit Genevieve for being the first protectress of Paris. While the men were fleeing because of her unfaltering faith, she convinced women to pray. But she saved Paris more than once. About a decade later, in the 460s, well, the king of the Franks by the name Childeric, he was uh, see, he sieged Paris and he attempted to starve the Roman supporters in the city by placing a food embargo on the river. Right, facing their children starving, having nothing to eat, Genevieve quietly gathered several boatmen and they sailed uh, sailed down the river very quietly and they gathered the grain past the embargo point. When they returned, it is said that Genevieve actually distributed all the food to the poorest people first. And she managed to, uh, to transport grain back to Paris several times. And believe me, they needed this grain because the siege of the Frankish king Childeric lasted for 10 years. But because of her wit, because of her nonviolence leadership, well, Paris was able to sustain itself uh, for 10 years without any open violent war. So on the other side of the Pantheon, you continue to see how she uh, helped to save Paris by transporting the grain here. And you see how she deserves to become our patron saint of the city here. So, um, well, around 480, the son of that set, uh, French, Frankish King Childeric by the name Clovis, would be uh, crowned the king of the Franks, therefore giving us our, the, the name of the country, kingdom of the Franks, France. And Clovis, if you think about it, um, if you drop the name C, well, his name is spelled Clovis, so C-L-O-V-I-S. Let me see, I can write it here. C L O. C L O V I S. Um, so if you drop the C at the beginning, you change the Latin V into modern U. So what name do you have? Quite simple. What do we have? L O U I S. You may have a pair of Louis shoes or a, a handbag, right? Um, or you may have a French friend whose name is Louis, so, so favorite name for the French. So because the first Frankish king who became a Catholic king who baptized himself is called Louis. So because of the persuade, persuasion of Saint Genevieve, Clovis or Louis, he's decided to make Paris his capital city. So since, since 500, uh, 508, Paris became the city of the kingdom of the Franks. So Ile de la Cité, the island itself, continued to be in the heart of uh, Paris. So Clovis uh, would build churches all over France. And um, much later on, right, so about 600 years later, finally Notre Dame would be built uh, on the original site of the Roman temple here. So on the right hand side the, in the red circle. And um, Clovis would then uh, move into the um, the Roman governor's uh, residence uh, that highlighted to you in the blue circle there. So this is where the secular power has been uh, since the time of Romans unchanged. So today it is actually the Supreme Court of France. But you can still see um, some of those original Roman walls even inside. So that's what it looks like uh, from the outside, the Supreme Court of Justice here. Um, so let me go on to our next, uh, um, next um, uh, period. So next to the Supreme Court, uh, the Palace of Justice, lies the Conciergerie. The Conciergerie was actually part of the, uh, the Royal Palace, where uh, on a daily basis, about 2,000 uh, people would be uh, fed, would be uh, eating and uh, be hosted inside this huge civic hall. And uh, it's named conciergerie because the man who takes care of the royal property is consigned for this job so his residence his domain became known as the conciergerie but we know the conciergerie much more uh, famously for the fact that it was used as a prison 
especially during the French Revolution. And uh, Marie Antoinette, the last queen of the French, was also present here in the conciergerie for her last 76 days. So, and just want to show you also on the eastern part of the island, a little bit further away from the tip, you have a bridge quite unnoticed. So we have more than, um, I believe, uh, 70 bridges in Paris. So this one, Pont de la Tunelle, um, has a petite, very interesting statue. Do you see this column-like statue on, on the bridge? So the statue here was made by a French sculptor by the name Paul Landowski in the year 1828. He would go on to make the very famous uh, Christ the Redeemer on the top of the uh, hill of Rio de Janeiro. So he made a statue. Any idea what do you think the statue actually represents here? We have a very tall, slim, um, veiled lady who is standing by a young child and the young child is holding a little boat, a nave here. And on the right hand side of the screen, you can see another similar boat in the Paris motto in the city emblem here. Is there any guesses here? I'm just trying to see your comments. This is actually Saint Genevieve once again. Saint Genevieve is represented here protecting this very young Christian city, Paris. And this boy, which is only about 500 years old at this point, Paris as a city. So it is very small and he holds a boat actually that represents himself. And our city emblem says, fluctuant neck Megita, tossed by the waves, but never sunk. As a settlement turned Roman city, turned Frankish capital, right? Uh, it is very much situated in the middle of the Seine River. And despite the tumultuous um, history uh, and wars and famines and diseases, right? Well, the city always floats on the Seine River and never sinks. And so, and this is how appropriate it is to have our city model represented by a boat and Genevieve protects this city since the fifth century here. And this is why uh, the, the statue actually facing east uh, from uh, facing the direction where Attila the Hun and his army right, marches on Paris. And this is also the reason why, in fact, Paul Landinsky, the sculptor who made it, uh, disliked um, the orientation, right? He actually said um, he did not approve this orientation. He wanted the statue Saint Genevieve to be protecting the island, the Notre Dame, looking over the Notre Dame rather than looking over to the east. So, but anyway, that's another chapter. So let's go on to the next uh, um, next um, period. So as we uh, move into the Middle Ages after the collapse of the Roman Empire and before the rebirth of the antiquity, this, this a thousand years time in the middle, we call the Middle Ages. So we've had many French Louis as kings of France, uh, at least 28 of them. Uh, but there's only one of them who has been made a saint who whose deed was considered great enough to be made a saint. And which Louis would that be? The ninth, the 14th, or the 16th? The 14th is known as the Sun King for building the Palace of Versailles, for moving the court from Paris to Versailles. The 16th is known as the guillotine chop chop king um, who died under the blade of the guillotine during the French Revolution. And so that leaves us Louis IX. This was our king uh, who became Saint Louis here. Saint Louis uh, lived in the palace, uh, the, the palace of the um, Palais de la Justice, the palace of the Supreme Court on the Western part of the island. And um, he was, he's really considered the most uh, Christian king that ever lived in France. He was, kind, he was just, he was, um, he 
the century that he ruled France was named the golden century of Saint Louis. He reformed the justice system and he introduced the concept of um, uh, assumption of innocence. So unless you have evidence, uh, you will not be proven guilty, which is a very modern concept. And he himself would listen to trials and dispense just, just, uh, justice. He himself was a very pious man. Um, he actually went on crusades twice and died in the final crusade in Tunisia. And in his free time, in his own time, he spent a lot of time praying, fasting, and making penance. And why would we have such a devout king, right? The answer is the mother. Of course, it's the mother, right? Like mother, like son. So the mother of King Louis IX or Saint Louis is Queen uh, Blanche of Castile. She is a princess uh, from Castile region. And um, she was married at 12 years old. Uh, first, um, she was already selected by her grandmother, the very famous uh, Eleanor of Aquitaine, the queen of Eleanor of Aquitaine to be the future wife for Louis VIII. And when she uh, was married at 12, uh, well, she was a bit too young, but finally from uh, 17 years onwards, she started producing children. She actually gave birth to 14 children. Not everyone survived, but when her husband died, the oldest of all the sons were Louis IX, who was about 12 years old. Um, so she took up the regency because Louis IX was still minor. And for the decade or so, she would be the one who really pulled the kingdom together for her son's rule. So she had to beat the submission of the rebel nobles, and she had to fend off the invasion of the English, and she arranged a bunch of marriages to consolidate the power. So by the time her son came to rule in his 20s, the country was prosperous, it was in peace. And so, And my favorite story about uh, the about Blanche of Castile was the way that she educated her uh, children. She used to say to all her children, and especially Louis IX, because he was going to be the one inheriting the throne, that my dear son, I love you tenderly. I love you with all my heart, but I would at any moment indefinitely rather see you drop dead at my feet then committing a mortal sin. So can you imagine your loving mother saying to you, she would rather see you dead than committing a mortal sin. And I guess it really helped on uh, Louis' uh, upbringing here. So um, while well, she was also a very devout mother herself, when Louis IX returned from her first crusade, she was really surprised to see that her son, very young, but already lost all his natural hair because of the very hot climate in Egypt and the very hard uh, journey itself. And, so, and uh, she asked the knights at the court for each of them to give a, um, um, a block of hair for anyone's hair that looked even remotely similar to the color of his her sons and with all of those blocks of hair that she collected she basically produced the first wig in history and because of her we have a the very important industry of wigs that still of course sustains today so we have to thank louis uh <laughs> louis's mother's ingenious idea blanche of castile so louis uh also also constructed this new chapel um, in in the palace of uh, next to the palace of justice. So this new chapel was to house the relics that he had just acquired from his cousin uh, from uh, Constantinople. And because he was a saint, this is why the chapel a saint built is named Saint Chapel. The Saint Chapel has two levels. I'm showing you the upper level here. This is where the king and his uh, VIPs will be able to gather and have mass and pray. And uh, down the nave facing uh, all the way to the eastern part, you can see this very beautiful tribune on the top. This is where the 
uh, holy relics used to be housed. Holy relics um, he purchased included the crown of thorns, a piece of true cross, and so on and so forth. Did you know that the money that he spent on buying, acquiring those relics for the prestige, for the Christian prestige of France, was actually three times the price that he actually spent in constructing the Saint Chapel. So the Saint Chapel was done uh, about 40 years after the Notre Dame Cathedral, but you can see it's exactly in this wonderful Gothic style, these pointed arches and with the beautiful uh, restored colors, the golden fleur de lis, I hope you can make it out on the ceiling here. So um, it's really a great um, option if you come back to Paris and unable to still go inside the Notre Dame to come and visit here. It's literally just a street away from the Notre Dame Cathedral. I'm sure some of you have been there and uh, remembers those stained glasses, right? More than a thousand, uh, 1,113 scenes from the Bible are represented and amazingly, 70% of those stained glasses are original from the 1200s. So one uh, Gothic church to visit in Paris, not to be missed, it is the Saint Chapel here. So now as the uh, population of Paris grows in the time of Saint Louis, we actually, Paris became the most populated city in Europe with about 250,000 people here. So um, eventually the king, um, the palace, is the, the royal residence is going to be relocated from the island to one of the banks. So, and uh, I would also want to, before we go to the banks, I also want to show you another island named Ile Saint Louis island of Saint Louis, uh, just to the east of Ile de la Cité, you hear, you see here, um, it's, it's considered one of the most um, beautiful property um, island in Paris. This is where the famous celebrities like, uh, I think Johnny Depp used to have one before his divorce, and uh, uh, what's the name, Brad Pitt, so ha would have their uh, pied a terre, these like vacation homes um, on the island of Saint Louis. But for those of us who cannot afford an apartment there, well, at least we can. We should go and try the ice cream Betty on there. So a Parisian family with their very own fresh organic produce, who produces wonderful flavors of, uh, of sorbets. You can see normal times, the line is 20, 30 people down the street. And so um, the, you, you, it's worth to know that their ice cream is also resold all over on the island. So anywhere you see the sign, Betion, you should try. And I think the, the most interesting uh, favor, flavor that you perhaps don't get in, um, in your home would be uh, salted uh, caramel with butter. So definitely try this one. So moving on uh, to our next heroine here. Now we have uh, my question. Did I, did it come up my question? Yes. So now who saved the French from the English? Yes, Terry, there we go. The English again. Are you English? <laughs> here, who saved the French from the English during the Hundred Years War. So the Hundred Years War, this very long war that started really just as a dispute about inheritance, about title, but it was changed dramatically from this uh, inheritance war into a religious war because it was saved by none else, but of course, Saint Joan of Arc. We don't really know how she looks like Joan of Arc. We don't know too much about um, her personal attributes, but we do know that when the pro-Burgundian soldiers burned her village down to the ground, uh, she started to heal, hear voices. God first told her how to be a good Christian girl, and then uh, she was then um, sh her hearing voices from God that she needed to protect the French king, Charles VII, and defend the France from the English. So in order to cross 
uh, she, the, the only thing she could do to make this plan happen is that she has to meet the Frankish, the French uh, Dauphin, Charles VII. So she had to cross this very dangerous area of Burgundy. And the only way for her to do that, to do that safely, was that to don male dress and to cut off her long hair. So when, uh, when she started leading the French troops, uh, she was successfully able to revert the whole, um, whole fate of the French. And I won't go on to too much about her story, but I want to share something um, maybe some of you are not aware that uh, when her story inspired Alfred Lynch for a, post for a poster in 1895, and so here uh, on the left, this uh, poster then went on to inspire a hairdresser by the name Antoine de Paris. Antoine de Paris wasn't French. He was a Polish hairdresser, but he was one of the first celebrity hairdressers who went on to dress people like um, Coco Chanel and Eleanor Roosevelt. And she, he was the one who really invented the bob hairstyle. So the a la garçon hairstyle because of the poster of uh, Joan of Arc by Alfred Lynch. You see this very tomboy look. So um, this is how it went on to, of course, inspire still uh, women of our age today. Can you imagine uh, without her very brave action of cutting off her hair, donning male's dress, and to do a man's job when no other man, not even the French king, can do. Right? So now, how would we have the courage? Uh, so to also show this uh, this very our strength in our. So I think she not only really turned the war from an inheritance war to a religious cause, but also she changed the entire history of fashion. Not only became the saint of France, but also the patron saint of bob hairstyles. So moving on to uh, where you can see Joan of Arc, you can see many of her statues a little bit to the east of the Louvre. Um, you have this uh, Place the Pyramid uh, where she was injured in about 1429, very close to this location. And then uh, over on the northern part of Paris, uh, there's also a statue of Saint Joan of Arc protecting the city of Paris. Can you make out that these two uh, bronze statues that's on the top of the facade of the Basilica of Sacre Coeur. On the left, we actually have our King Louis IX, Saint Louis. On the right, we have Joan of Arc. So two French saints protecting the city of Paris from the heights of the hill. So here, as Paris continued to grow throughout those thousand years in the medieval time, uh, we have um, the island no longer enough. Therefore, um, the, the districts, the 20 districts that we have today basically uh, springs uh, around the island, Io della City, in a clockwise manner, like a snail crawling out. So you have this clockwise growth, all because of the river here. So even if you look at the street number, the, the, the streets that's perpendicular to the river, you will find the smallest number closest to the river. So, and, uh, and protecting the city, birth at its core at Ile de la Cité. So you have Saint Genevieve on the east and the south and Joan of Arc on the north and east. So coming out of a thousand year long medieval time, we come into this rebirth of science, arts, the Renaissance. So, and uh, in the Renaissance time, the royalty decided that they didn't want to live uh, on the island anymore. It was stinky, it was crowded, and uh, there was no space to expand the palace, and it was not very safe. So they decided to move to one of the city banks. And uh, where do you think was the next place that the royalty moved? So I'm going to launch my next poll question here. Was it Versailles or was it the Louvre? Of course, most of you get it right. It is the Louvre. The Louvre was originally built around the same time of the Notre Dame 
in the Middle Ages, about 12, it's in the 12th century. So uh, today, the Louvre, of course, uh, serves as the biggest museum in the world. And when it started 800 years ago, it was a very small, but nonetheless, uh, intimidating stronghold. It was a fortress with a dry moat in the center, with a wet moat outside, with 10 towers and watchtowers and so on and so forth. Again, right next to the Seine, protecting the French from the English that coming up on the River Seine or the Vikings. So um, over the next 800 years, you know, more than 20 kings have lived through this period. And um, the moment, the, the deciding moment came for the Louvre when the French Revolution took place. So it it was in the year 1793 that the Louvre finally opened its doors to the public. The old collections of the artwork of the paintings and sculptures from the kings and the queens now belongs to the people. So we have the first museum in the world in 1793. And how many pieces of artwork do you think you can see in the biggest museum in the world? Let's see. For those of you who've been there, of course, you know, it cannot be done in a day, right? On display, there are 35,000 pieces of artwork. Let's say that we were going to see all of it. No break, no sleep, no rest. Let's say, let's be, let's be honest, let's be realistic. Half a minute per piece, right? No, without any break and sleep, you will need only 12 straight days to see all the 35,000 pieces of artwork on display. But that's only 10% of its all collection, right? So there's many more that is in archives. So uh, such a big museum, what really happened to the museum and all this collection during wartime? How do you protect such a space? How do you protect these priceless art? What do you think happened during World War II when the Louvre, uh, when Paris was occupied for four years long? right, between 1940 uh, to 44. So, well, we had a museum director by the name Jean Jean-Jacques. Uh, and um, he was um, he was very uh, aware of how the war situation was developing, and so even before war, uh, the year before uh, nineteen in nineteen thirty nine, August twenty fifth, he actually had the museum closed for three days and told the public there was going to be works inside the museum. Instead, he organized the evacu secret evacuation of the Louvre Museum. Hundreds of uh, the uh, staff, even with former staff, and students of art from the nearby Louvre School, for example, they joined hand by hand. They came and they tailor made crates to protect the sculptures and they labeled every single art piece by priority. And this is how, within three days, they had moved out almost the entire collection and then transferring them to the different castles, first in the Loire Valley. And the last piece to leave the museum was also the, the heaviest, the most difficult to maneuver, and that is the, the goddess of victory, Nike, on the very right-hand side, and she left the museum on September the 3rd, 1939. Well, this is all very good for the Louvre, and you see when Nazi actually came in 1940, they can see down the grand hallway, there's nothing else but empty frames. And so at this time, Mona Lisa would already be in safety um, in the church, in the chapel, in the Chateau de Chambon at this moment. Uh, she would later on be moved another at least five times. And so, but what about the rest of the French civilians? What about the rest of uh, the Jewish families? So, right, 38,000 families, their houses, their apartments include their all everything in their apartment. They were completely emptied uh, by the Nazis. So including curtains and forks and art and toys. So, and these were loaded onto trains, more than 600 cart trains. They departed, uh, transporting these to Germany. Right? So, and so who saved those art? from disappearing off the face of the earth or from, from pillaging. So this is a story that's really 
not told enough. And this is the story of the resistance resistance fighter, Hose Valand. So Hose Valand comes from a little country provincial town and she first trained to be a teacher, but her passion was really art. And so she trained to become an art historian. She studied in the Museum of Fine Arts and she started in School of Fine Arts. She started also in the very prestigious Echo du Louvre uh, School of Louvre. And um, she actually started of her career as an unpaid volunteer to one of the museums in Paris. This museum is called Je de Pont. So, and um, I want to show you uh, that it may, her story may remind you a movie called The Monuments Men, played very well by uh, Kate Blanchett. So excellent job there. So uh, has anybody seen the movie, may remember the movie? Let's see. Kate, uh, in The Monuments Men, uh, we, we learn about these team of uh, American, mostly American, North American um, male art experts, curators of the Metropolitan Art Museum, for example, uh, in real life by the name Rorimer. And um, they formed this group and they came to Europe and they were looking for those stolen arts. And so, uh, but really the untold story uh, is Rose Valente without her, they would have no clue what to look, where to look, and how to return those stolen art. So, um, so Rose Valente, she was a uh, unpaid volunteer um, from 1932. She was actually in this museum, Jeux de Pomme, and later she was made an assistant there. So when the Nazi occupation started, because they thought she was so unassuming and on, uh, you know, um, uh, on not dangerous, and they actually kept her uh, in a, in an office handling the phone calls, and um, they made sure there's no French uh, officials staying in the museum Jeux de Pomme because the Jeux de Pomme became a sorting place, become a storage place. All the thirty eight thousand homes that I mentioned earlier that have been emptied, all those Jewish families' possessions that have been um, taken away, right, and they were sorted out in the place called Jeux de Pomme. And Goring, he himself personally took his private train 21 times to come and view those arts. And it became almost his private salon where he freely decided what he was going to take at no price, at no cost. So, And it was in this situation where Rose Valland became a spy. So for four years there, every day with renewed risk, she, uh, she was spying on information. Where are these art coming from? Who do they belong to? Where they're going to? Which train they're going to be? And she would copy out some of these information, sometimes just in front of uh, others on a notebook. And, uh, and she would also chat with the lorry truck drivers to find out the, 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 where the goods are going. And because of her meticulous uh, keeping of the information and you know, the fact that she hit uh, the fact that she actually understood German. So, and um, this is how uh, she was able to report all of these intelligence to Jean-Jacques, um, who went on uh, to really organize appropriate actions. For example, uh, on August 1944, just the month of liberation, right, she made sure she made sure to pass the information because she knew that the last batch of the uh, artwork from the Louvre is leaving uh, Paris. And uh, she, um, because there were five carloads of them that were actually artworks, paintings and sculptures. So she made sure to pass this information on to Jean-Jacques and uh, who organized a kind of like a, a train worker strike to delay the departure because um, they wanted to make sure that the train was not going to be bombed by the allies because it was already August during the liberation time. And so, and this is how the train actually never uh, departed Paris in the end. So because all of this uh, uh, work that was not so, that was so dangerous and at the same time, um, uh, so heroic. So this is how uh, Rose Valland um, just by being, um, just by being, uh, by, by, uh, 
risking her life, really. And every day for those four years, she was suspected. She was fired several times, but she went back. And、um, somebody told her that she could risk being shot and tortured and died. And she said, "You know, any any human being at this point would know the risk." And she went on, and her effort actually did not stop there. After the war, she spent another nearly decade there, and she became a captain, sort of like a. a、um, A lieutenant colonel in the U.S.、Uh, Army、uh, ranking, and she、uh, her her work in Germany for those decades、uh, would would help to retrieve、uh, about eighty thousand pieces of artwork、um, uh, to back to the right Reich's owners there. So, and this is why next time we watch the Monuments Man, you know, we need to. Propose to make a sequel to the story of、uh, Rose Vallon, the Monuments Woman. So, finally, after the Louvre being a Renaissance palace,、uh, we have the final、um, palace of the French Revolution. This is Versailles. Versailles was a very sh- long, short-lived. Uh, palace. It was only about a hundred and seven years' time when those Louis ruled France as an absolute monarch. So you can、uh, imagine those opulence, the wealth, the gold, the 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 refined, the refineness that you know we so often associate with Versailles, right? The mirrors, the chandeliers. So only a hundred and seven years exactly.、Um, So what we have, what, but、um, because of the,、um, but we have to thank one woman、uh, to bring France to the state of this very high refined art and luxury goods. And this woman was actually not a queen, but a mistress. So this is a mistress work in Versailles,、uh, especially for. The Sevres porcelain that、uh, that we're talking about today.、Um, that so any idea who I am talking about? Let's see. I have a couple of choices here. Madame de Pompadour, Madame du Barry, Madame de Montespan. <laughs> If you watch the Versailles series of、uh, was the Canal, so. You may know the name Madame de Pont,、uh, Montespan. That's the mistress of Louis the Fourteenth, and she has nothing to do with that. And the other two mistress, Madame de Pompadour and Barry, they're both mistresses of Louis the Fifteenth. And the correct answer is Madame de Pompadour. So, Madame de Pompadour, which we have the famous rose color, rose pompadour, right? So,、uh, is the reason. Why we have such refined state in France? So who is she really? She wasn't born in aristocracy. So she was born、um, in a little bourgeois family in Paris, and she was actually、uh, raised in a convent and given a good education by the nuns. But at nine years old, she was sick and she had to leave the convent. And her mother decided to take her to see a fortune teller by the name Madame Le Bon. So there are other very famous fortune tellers in French history, but today, well, she went to、uh, Madame Le Bon. Madame Le Bon said to、uh, the mother and child that she, for sure, is going to grow up and win the hearts of the king. Okay, well, her mother was totally convinced of this prophecy. And brings her home, continues to provide her daughter with an excellent private education. So, on top of reading, right, she learned how to act, how to play, how to sing, how to dance, and she was beautiful. She was very talented. She was married at twenty to、uh, to the niece of her stepfather, and after being married and entering into、uh, a An、um, even higher bourgeois level.、Uh, she started frequenting those fa-、uh, Paris salons, and this is where, because of her literary interest, she met figures like Voltaire,、uh, Diderot, and she was、uh, not only interested in attending; she actually decided to create her own salon、um, at her own property.
So she had a very successful salon. She became a master of conversation, and everybody really just adored her. So her salon, her property is situated on the edge of the royal hunting grounds. And、um, she, even though she was actually married, right, and she even had two children, she did not forget her destiny, which was going to please to win the hearts of the king, which was Louis the Fifteenth at that time. She, Louis the Fifteenth would have been uh, about uh, about twelve years older、uh, than her. So it was when she was about twenty three years old she decided that she it's time for her to make her appearance to the king. So how do you cause the attention of the king? How do you get the attention of the king? Because the, her property is very close to the king's hunting grounds, she decided to just、uh, appear in the middle of the woods. Right? She started observing the king and his hunting troops, and to enter the hunting grounds, it would be illegal. But she went anyway. So the first time she went, and she was dressed with a pink dress and、uh, part, uh, parked herself on a blue carriage. And the next time she went dressed in a blue dress and parked herself on a pink carriage, and it worked. The king noticed her and gave her gifts. And very soon after that, the king's official mistress passed away. So the king is free again to pick another new mistress. And the king very quickly invited、uh, Madame de Pompadour. I forgot to tell you her actual name is Jean Antoinette Poisson. So invited Jean Antoinette to this party. This was a big party. It was a masked ball party at Versailles. It was to celebrate the marriage of the crowned prince, the son of the king, basically. So this was a masked. Ball party, and she dressed, of course, as the goddess of hunting, Diana, invoking the scene where he met, where they we met, the, where they met in the woods, and the king with a couple of male courtiers dressed up as yew trees, and the king was smitten by her beauty, and it was that evening during the mask ball party that the king couldn't hold it and declared his、um, declared his passion. For Jean Antoinette openly, and in the next two months, right, she was legally separated from her husband, and the king procured a title for her. She became known as Madame de Pompadour, or Pompadour, or Marquise de Pompadour, and、uh, she was very quickly made the official mistress of the king. So you may wonder, what do you think the queen? You know, what the queen is thinking about all of this, right? Well, the queen. Actually, um, uh, suffered with uh, quite a, suffered quite a lot from the previous quite haughty mistresses who didn't really respect her. And Madame de Pompadour, however, was completely different. She told the queen that she very much respected the queen and her role and her duty, and she had no intention to、uh, to overstepping her. And and actually, the queen、uh, felt very good about her and even really、uh, um, appreciated her. So they got along very well, and、uh, Madame de Pompadour、uh, would, you know,、uh, become now the most important figure in the court, who、uh, was also made the waiting of lady, lady of waiting、uh, to the queen and the official mistress, who had the power basically to convince the king, right? Who had the power to decide on important appointments, important dismissals, and important projects of France. And she also had a passion for hot chocolate, as you see, that、uh, hot chocolate was.、Um, Uh, was quite a, a favorite uh, drink uh, in the court, and、uh, one of our queen, Queen of Louis the Fourteenth, actually had so much hot chocolate during one of her pregnancies. She drank so much of the chocolate, her baby girl was born chocolate color skinned. At least that's what she said in the end. But coming back to Madame de Pompadour, so. When she became、uh, the queen, the the, the official mistress,、um, she、um, she really for the next twenty years she became a friend, and also an advisor, a confidant 
to the king. A few years into their relationship, she stopped being the mistress, but she would still always remain、uh, a good advisor to the king. It's because of her she was a patron of arts of all its forms that we had these these following people are to、uh, um, have her to thank to. Because of her, she convinced the king to appoint Voltaire as the court official historiographer to、uh, to document the victories of the king. And Voltaire was given a fixed job at the court of Versailles, two thousand pounds of francs a year, and an apartment in Versailles. And the king was also against、uh, the publication of encyclopedia. But Madame de Pompadour was very clever. Well, she had pretended that she she had a disagreement with the king, and she remarked that, well, if we had the encyclopedia, we can resolve our argument by checking by looking it up in the encyclopedia. So she successfully convinced the king to lift the ban on the publishing of the encyclopedia, and because of her, she was the major support patron support for the、uh, first the publication of the two. Volumes there, and she also appointed painters, sculptors, cabinet makers, jewelry makers, uh, uh, theater producers, uh, players, uh, uh, theater players, all of them, and she 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 commissioned them for to produce beautiful artworks. So, and most importantly, she saved the crumbling serve manufacturer. So the serve manufacturer,、uh, before Madame de Pompadour took over, it was really about to close, and they also had very limited range of products. So, but she realized the potential of this, and she knew that France needed to boost its own export industry, and、um, she started to、uh, promote their、uh, product. To supervise the quality of them, and she often used Sev manufactured porcelain as diplomatic gifts to other countries in Europe to present that France now is also capable of manufacturing beautiful porcelains like this, and particularly her favorite color, the pink color here. So, and because of. Uh, because of her promotion, her patronage, that the Sev still thrives today. And did you know that the very famous impressionist painter August Renoir, when he started his、uh, artist career, he was trained for years as a porcelain painter in the Sev. So you can almost associate those beautiful colors and the sweet. Figures and the smiles of his nudes, like these beautiful flowers on the Perseve porcelain. So that is the reason why. Right? So Renoir had this very solid ground、um, of training here. So、uh, now let's move on to、uh, perhaps the uh, most. <laughs> Uh, ignored the contribution by Madame de Pompadour, which was the hairstyle. So, because of her favorite way of dressing the hair by、uh, pulling them up high and often decorating the strands of hair with pompons or flowers, so we have this hairstyle、uh, called a Pompadour style. So Elvis and、um, David Beckham again has Madame de Pompadour to thank for. So, and it's also said the legends now. These are the legends. Now, that the、um, the king wanted to make diamonds as a gift for Madame de Pompadour、uh, with the shape of her sensuous lips, and this is how we have this particular cut of diamond called the Matisse cut. And on the left, it's more like this. Definitely, is legend again that the champagne、uh, glass so is actually shaped as her breast. And so that's again some businessman's uh, uh, clever. Sales tactic, but she did have her brother also appointed as the uh, building, building,、uh, building. Uh, superintendent, and、uh, she interested herself in many of the building projects as well. So, in, which building in Paris do you think was supported by her, which continues? To stand today, is it the Louvre, the military school, the Eiffel Tower? Right, Eiffel Tower, of course, is rather 
a modernity product, so from 1889. And the Louvre was before her. So it's actually the military school that was her idea. So she, want, she persuaded the King Louis XV to build an academy for those poor uh, noble men's sons so that they can have a place, a school to learn and train to become officers. And this is where the Eco Militaire military school uh, standing at the park of the Eiffel Tower, right? That still is a military school today. And this is where also where Napoleon Bonaparte went to study uh, at 15 years old, where uh, graduating a year later and becoming a lieutenant and a decade later, right? The, uh, the emperor of the French. So another, um, another uh, public space that was also her idea was called Place Louis XV, Square of Louis XV, which doesn't exist anymore. So this used to be a square, very fashionable uh, square, where you would uh, promenade with your nice dresses with a equestrian statue of the king in the center. But today, this is what we call Place de la Concorde. So Place de la Concorde, replaced the original uh, Place Louis XV. And uh, why did it happen in this way? Place de la Concorde, um, during what, okay, let me see. The question here is Place de la Concorde, Louis XV square, uh, was used for what, what was it used for during the French Revolution of 1789? Uh, I just have a message from someone that says that uh, they have trouble hearing it. Do you hear? Do you hear me fine? Do you guys hear me fine? For those of you who are, yes, okay. Most of you, okay, great. Thank you for your hint. Audio is good? Okay, great. Um, all right, 100% of you are, Absolutely, absolutely right. It was used as a public execution ground. And the famous Place de la Revolution from 1792 onwards, poor Parisians, revolutionaries, anti revolutionaries, the Jacobins, everybody uh, well, had their blood spilled on this uh, Place de la Revolution. The king himself included on January 27th, 1793. The blood was so much that they had to literally relocate the guillotine, the scaffolding every couple of days to avoid it, to, to the, because the blood has soaked the ground to avoid it toppling. Even 10 years after all of this bloodshed was over, the uh, horses and cattle, they still refuse to go near because of the smell so deeply trenched in the ground. And in the same Place de la Concorde, there was this woman, Olympe de Gouges, who also uh, was executed in November 1793. So Olympe de Gouges, and uh, she can really be considered as the first feminist in French history. So Alain de Gouge was also born in a, uh, in a bourgeois family. She was actually a illegitimate child, but she received a very good education and um, uh, her mother treated, loved her. Her, 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 her illegitimate father also really loved her, but all of this did not prevent her fate of being forced into a marriage without love. She was forced to marry a butcher. And um, uh, at 16 years old, she was forced to marry. And uh, after giving birth to a son the next year, her, her husband also dies being much, much older than her. And um, even though she did have another happy relationship with another um, Navy officer, she decided that she did not want to be married anymore. She wanted to remain free. She wanted to just um, 
uh, be, she, she renamed herself, uh, refused to be called a widow. So she called herself Olympe de Gouge. And this is where uh, she would start um, publication, publi publishing um, works, writings under this name. So um, her, she's very famous uh, for her outspokenness during the French Revolution. And, um, and she said that a woman has the right to mount the scaffold, and she must also uh, possess equally the right to mount the speaker's platform. And this is exactly what happened to her. She uh, became one of the most outspoken revolutionaries, female revolutionaries. And so uh, what really happened uh, to her? Well, she had this very uh, easy life. Uh, she, comes, she was born in Montauban, and uh, she had her son, and she had her lover. And she decided, though, to come to Paris. So she came to Paris with her son, and she started also frequenting those literary salons. And she also started to attend theaters. And she realized her passion was also writing plays. And she had, uh, with the help, with the financial help of her, her lover, she actually um, created her own theat uh, theatrical company. And they were touring as well. She started also writing plays. And she um, really made her name, uh, rather, uh, she made herself notorious. It was in the year um, 1785. Why? Because she wrote a, a play that's uh, that's actually that that discussed um, from a, from the slave's perspective about slavery. So, and in her book, she, in her play, right, she actually promoted equality, not women not just women, but also slaves. So she said the mortals are equal and it's not birth that is the only virtual that makes the difference. So this was the play that really earned death threats from mostly slave owners. And um, she, for, for, for years, and she would be uh, scared. She would, she would receive these threats. And uh, yet she never really... Um, faltered her views and she continued on and especially during those uh, politically um, engaged years of 1791 when the declaration of the rights of the men and citizens were published and the king signed uh, before her before his uh, guillotine Hollande de Gouges very disappointed by the fact that there was no inclusion of women women's rights whatsoever in this declaration of the rights of man and citizen. So she followed up uh, with, a, uh, with the publication of a declaration of the rights of women and citizen. She actually handed over this uh, booklet to the queen, Marie Antoinette. But very soon after that, they were both present in the conciergerie. And she was also put to guillotine because of her open, uh, um, open uh, activity, these uh, politically prolific uh, activity on attacking the regime, the, the republic. And this is how she did earn her speech, right? But also earned her guillotine. Uh, and, um, but her braveness would go on to inspire other female feminists such as Mary Wollenstonecraft, uh, who went on to write uh, very important books like Vindication right, so of Women. So, uh, well, what do you think was the end of the public guillotine execution in France? At Place de la Concorde, uh, Place de la Revolution, it ended uh, pretty soon, uh, around 1793. But the last public, I mean, the, the last guillotine execution in France as a um, as an execution of death penalty, what do you think? Which year was it? Eighteen eighty nine. That's when the Eiffel Tower is built. You see, right? Um, 1939, this is when uh, the last public guillotine execution uh, took place. And the 
last ever guillotine execution was actually in 1977 in the month of July. So this is pretty much uh, a month or two after uh, the movie Star Wars, the last man who died under the blade of guillotine, literally had the chance to watch the first episode of Star Wars before losing his head. So now, no, today we no longer have the guillotine, but we have the Egyptian obelisk, which is worth noting that it is original obelisk being the oldest monument outdoors in Paris, 3,300 years old, was not looted, was not a souvenir by Napoleon to Napoleon. It was actually a gift from uh, Egypt in 1836. So, and um, it's a beautiful uh, place where, um, where today you, you have this, you know, uh, the view of the Champs Elysees, the Eiffel Tower, uh, Place Vendôme, Tuileries, to all of those uh, um, in the city center. So moving on to uh, oh, this, uh, yeah, of course, this is also where the Tour de France will conclude as this um, as the game here. And now, after all that bloodshed of the French Revolution, and now we had Napoleon. When the first Napoleon was gone, well, we had the Republic, and then we had another Napoleon, Napoleon III. So it is in the time of Napoleon III, we had this uh, epoch, we had this period called the Belle Epoque. So what is the Belle Epoque? The Belle Epoque was basically about 40 years uh, of peace. It's between 1870 to World War I. So where we had no revolution, no uprising, no civil war, no hunger. So, and Paris had just been remade by Napoleon III. He had completely destroyed the old medieval Paris and replaced with the Paris that we love today, with the wide boulevards, the trees, the gas lamps, the indoor shopping galleries, the open public parks, the monument like Opera Garnier, all of that uh, Paris with the vista that was born in this period in the 18, between the 1850s and 70s. So with this new Paris here, we also have a new liberated sense of the French women, don't we? And I think speaking of the sense, the best representative is the dance here. So what do you think is the most emblematic dance of this new liberated France in this Belle Epoque period? Launching my poll. Here we go. Yes, of course. For those of you who is not sure of what Ken Ken is or how it would represent France, I think it's time to have a look at it. This is from a movie from the 1950s. Here we go.
So yes, has anybody actually seen uh, a cancan? Maybe at the Moulin Rouge, maybe at Lidl. Uh, I guess not exactly like that. Huh? So today's uh, dance is rather uh, restrained in one sense <laughs> and liberated in another sense. So uh, it's the cancan dance. So what does the word cancan -can mean? Cancan -can is the French word for noisy commotion, right? That's what they do when they dance. They scream, they shout. It takes a lot of energy here. So the cancan -can dance is made uh, perhaps most famously associated with the Moulin Rouge Cabaret, the Red Windmill Cabaret. And um, the Moulin, the, the can, can dance, however, before it was, um, the, the Moulin Rouge, just a little bit about the Moulin Rouge, in fact, uh, um, it was built the same year as the Eiffel Tower. In, it was it opened its business as a cabaret in 8089. There used to be even a, a beautiful wooden elephant in the courtyard, in the gardens, where uh, it's actually with, comes with dance halls and uh, beer garden sort of uh, uh, play, uh, um, stage and um, the can, can was not a dance that was invented by the Moulin Rouge. It was already um, it was already a dance uh, before the Moulin Rouge was born. As back as the beginning of the 1800s, it was a dance that mostly was done by one man in the center with two other uh, ladies on the side. It was the man who was really manipulating the other women in the center and controlling their movement. And men was more like the star of the dance. As you can see with all the high kicks and the twisting, it's a very athletic uh, dance. So it was men in the center more as, as the star. So uh, we're really, the, there was one woman who really changed the fame of the Cancan -can dance, as well as the fame of the Moulin Rouge, in a way that it became uh, an emblematic dance that associated with all liberated women in France. And this woman was called Jane Avro. Jane Avro, uh, she was born to an alcoholic mother in the poor neighborhoods of Paris. And her mother used to beat her up at least twice every day, predictably. And uh, when she was 16 years old, she finally couldn't stand it anymore. She ran away from her home and she went into uh, and she was taken in a hospital in an asylum in Paris where she was treated for about a year and a half there. So she had the symptoms called St. Vitus symptom. Basically, she would have incontrollable convulsions of the body and um, and there with the other of the asylum inmates and so she actually was starting to get much better there were some programs that were organized at the asylum include including uh, dance evenings and there was one evening where uh, she heard the music of the walls coming and uh, well she started walk towards the dance floor and without any training without any uh, um, without any really, uh, in, uh, she it just turned out that she was just a natural. So, and she later recalled in her own memoir that I shall be able to let myself be carried away by the music. It is perhaps one of those multiple expressions so conveniently named madness. And if it is this one, it has always been sweet and comforting to me. It helped me to stay alive. And I say, I stay its slaves. So it is because of music, because of dance. She actually found a way to release her tensions, release her trauma that she built up over the last 16 years of this um, uh, traumatic life. And when she came out of the asylum, uh, in the day she was doing some small jobs and at night uh, she would uh, go dancing uh, to, to get some extra money. So uh, she was spotted by the owner of the Moulin Rouge and uh, very, uh, uh, very specially, she was treated very specially and she was actually given a, a proper artist professional salary there. So unlike uh, the rest of those girls, she could wear whatever she wanted. She even had the opportunity to design costumes for herself. She was also given uh, the chance to dance solo. So she would be 
alone on the stage without any girls, and she usually doesn't really have a rehearsed um, dance. She would just be very impulsive and spontaneous. And because of her unique energy, so she had this very um, uh, this very special draw of her so when it comes to this uh this individual can can dance here and you can see the toulouse Le Le Troc, uh actually became one of her good friends not only drew posters for her dance such as the one in the middle of jane averill promoting her uh, her program and but also in private life toulouse Le Troc also uh has done a few uh, paintings uh, uh, for Jane Averill as well as a private person. So she had this uh, privilege to even design her costumes. And you can see the way that she's able to twist her body and those uh, uh, special uh, high kicks and just, just this energy that's coming from her really made her a star. And she was so sought after all over the cabarets in Paris and Moulin Rouge really profited by having her as the star. Uh, and she was also uh, even sent to perform in other cities like London. So um, all of this really because of her, uh, that this the, the can can dance not only become just a, um, a, a, a a staple of the cabarets of Montmartre, the fun Belle Epoque life here, but also it, it's it's it gave the world an image of how French women at this time, right, who normally they would be wearing such long dresses covering their you know, get covering their feet, right? And they would be openly dancing and showing their pant, showing their uh, panty hoses and all of this. So this really gave the world an impression that the French women have gained so much uh, liberation in their own place. And those artists, those female dancers are now considered proper professional artists who earn a respectable high salary as well. And so all of this uh, bohemian lifestyle, of course, surrounds a Montmartre and uh, many artists documented this um, uh, life in Montmartre and to see those impressionists these artwork where do you see where do you think you can see most of those artworks in Paris which museum are you able to see the work of toulouse lautrec for example or Renoir and of course Monet. Monet didn't really paint the dancers of the Moulin Rouge but uh, you get to see the countryside life that was captured also uh, picnicking uh, just rowing on the Seine River and all of that also by Monet uh, in the Orsay Museum of course. So don't forget to go to the top of the floor on the fifth floor to get a view of Montmartre with the Basilica of Sacré-Cœur on the top here. And because of this reputation, uh, another view of the Orsay Museum, because of this reputation that we have uh, of France being uh, so women so liberated here, so uh, it also helped by um, fashion designers as well. And so this is my next question. Who is that fashion designer that came to liberate women from their dresses? Oh, sorry. Who, which fashion designer, um, which fashion designer was the creator of the little black dress? This little black dress, the black, the color black has been for centuries uh, associated with the color of mourning, of death, or of funeral. But Coco Chanel was able to turn it into the color of elegance. Right? So that who doesn't have a little piece of black dress in your wardrobe today? Coco Chanel was also born in a little, in a little remote French village. And um, her her mother passed away when she was twelve years old. Her mother didn't. Her father didn't really care about the family and just puts her abandons the whole family abandons her in a uh, in a nunnery. But it was in the nunnery with the rest of the nuns that she learned her lifelong uh, trade, which is sewing. 
and she really perfected that skill. She sold so well that uh, after she left the convent, after a brief stint as a singer, and uh, she dis- and she encountered some wealthy man, and with their financial aid, Coco Chanel, Gabrielle Chanel, born Gabrielle, would go on uh, to start her first shop. Her first shop was not exactly selling clothes yet. Her first shop in Paris on Rue Combon was only selling hats. It was a millinery shop. It was very successful because her hat was natural, was not bulky, uh, was made of straw tied with lovely ribbons, and it really freed women from those very uh, bulky, large uh, hats traditionally. So it became so popular that she continued to open shops in touristic resorts, uh, seaside places such as Duvi and Biarritz. And uh, she also started launching her clothing line at these uh, resort places. So now the traditional uh, way for women to dress uh, from the 1800s uh, is basically dress. Did you know that it was even illegal, right? It's a, there's a law from 1800s that's saying that women cannot wear trousers. They need to ask a special permission from the police to be able to wear trousers. And wearing trousers has always been traditionally associated with lower class people, those people uh, who cannot afford these stockings, like the bourgeois way of dressing, right? So those one, those revolution, those those grassroots revolutionaries cannot wear the stockings are called the sans culottes. So they wear pants. And this has also become sort of like a symbol of those uh, grassroots uh, poorest people, uh, the revolutionaries. But Coco Chanel herself though, she was seen very often right, uh, at the beach, very fashionable, wealthy beach resorts. And she would be wearing these very wide pants and she would wear, uh, inspired from sailors, color the blue, she would wear strips and these white pants. And women, other women started to imitate her. She also asking uh, to wear similar hats, similar uh, pants. And uh, she said that luxury must be first comfortable, otherwise it is not luxury and she wanted to make fashion that women can really live in breathe in feel comfortable in and look younger in so she really wanted women not only just to wear a set of different clothes but to live a different life she herself was rather athletic she was really fond of riding horses and so she used to make clothes for her for her to to be convenient to ride horses and so she also wanted women to experience to be active to experience life and live a life uh, by having the right uh, clothes. So it is not, so this, her luxury has become so elegant and has defied centuries uh, of beauty, right? The definition of beauty. But uh, it is America who really, you know, fall in love with her. Uh, with her design at first. You see Jackie Kennedy was a big fan of her, uh, the, the, the tweed suits and uh, uh, become uh, a, a, like um, one of her most famous uh, um, designs. And uh, Coco, speaking of Coco Chanel, I want to introduce you uh, to one of her favorite uh, hangout places in Paris. So this uh, place not far away from the Louvre Museum is called the Angelina Cafe. And uh, her favorite uh, uh, dessert, the Mont Blanc uh, here, featured on the right bottom corner. And uh, the hot chocolate, if you go, you do have to try. So uh, it's extremely dense and thick though so, but you've got to try the angelina hot chocolate very unforgettable and um she had this shop at Rue Combo, but um, um, she did have an apartment as well on the upper floors, but she really preferred somewhere else that's just a stone throw away from her shop. And it's at the Place Vendôme where she really find her, um, her home. So uh, at Place Vendôme, this, uh, uh, this beautiful square that has been every single building is here is classified as historical monument and one of these buildings is the hotel of um, Ritz-Carlton 
And this is where Coco Chanel actually lived for 34 years of her life. So her room 302 is also for rent, of course. Uh, it cost about 1,000, at least 2,500 euros a night. During the fashion weeks of Paris, of course, this price would go even much higher. And I just want to show you a couple of more pictures of her hotel room 302 at the Ritz Carlton overlooking the Place Vendôme um, column here. So this is another woman uh, that uh, Coco who never really considered herself or set off to be a feminist, but because her uh, her own uh, character, her own um, vision, right? She really helped to liberate women from those corsets, from those uh, traditional way of view of life. And because of women like Jane Avril, Coco Chanel, and the image of France being such a liberated place, and this really attracted a lot of American expects to come to France at the end of the 1800s and beginning of the 1900s especially. So we had uh, women from all walks of our, our life like Mary Cassette who was a painter who had this painting uh, of a, a female spectator in the opera house not only uh, no longer being a passive um, passive uh, figure being observed by the rest of the world, she is an active participant uh, in this cultural life. And so she is actively looking out the performance through a spectacle here. And America said, we have Gertrude Stein, who, without whom, I would not know how the story of Picasso would write out. Picasso might as well just turn out to be a second Vincent van Gogh, would have you know, become, uh, would have died maybe without selling uh, many paintings. So Picasso, uh, Gertrude Stein was the only uh, patron, the art collector, who purchased the uh, Picasso's work. And um, uh, yes, yeah, so Gertrude Stein, who was a uh, author herself, and uh, also with Mary Cassette, with Sylvia Beach and Josephine Baker, they all moved to Paris and they spend the rest of their lives in Paris, France, and died, all died and buried here. Sylvia Beach is another great example, um, a literary uh, um, lover who opened a bookstore called the Shakespeare and Co. And in her bookstore, she was uh, she allowed women to come and read the books for free. So this way, the women did not have to beg their husbands for money to purchase book or to be controlled by uh, their by their family on what they're reading because they wouldn't have the resources to do that. And of course, last but not least, the famous Josephine Baker. Right? So uh, with her revolutionary banana dance also um, changed the view of women <laughs> um, in her time. Now, coming finally uh, to our final uh, time in the time that we live today. So, and any idea who is our city mayor in Paris today? And is that, that's an easy one, isn't it? Of course, our city mayor today is Anne Hidalgo. Anne Hidalgo was originally born in Spain, but moved to Paris when she was small. And uh, would you have spotted our city mayor, mayor of Paris, if you were on the street cycling or walking? So that's she is, there she is. She's riding on one of those city-owned free circulation bikes, Velib. And uh, she she's a big fan of, um, of green, uh, energy, of uh, sustainability, of biking, cycle lanes, and she's been the city mayor since 2014, and she has just won her second uh, uh, term here. And um, Anne Hidalgo had this vision for Paris. Uh, she wanted to bring more livable space to the Parisians. And one of her projects was the Paris Beach, which we absolutely adore here in Paris as Parisians. I'm sure you tourists love it too here. So for those of you who've been, you know that in summer in Paris for the hottest month and a half, we would have these man-made beach set up along the Seine River here. And we have 5,000 tons of clean sand that will be dropped from the beaches that will be taken by cargo boats from the beaches of Normandy. And you would have 
palm trees, you know, in their pots and, uh, you know, free umbrellas and benches. Right? So it's a really um, idyllic place to enjoy the city and its shade. And so this was one of her initiatives very successfully. And her for the future, she has even bigger plans. We have the uh, Hotel de Ville, which is the city mayor's office. So right there in the center of Paris in the fourth district, it's again, uh, not far away from the island, Ile de la Cité and Notre Dame. And uh, this is where she works and lives. And she wanted to make more green space such as this one, right? So making it more a place where it's not just for, uh, for, for, for exhibiting, for exhibition, right? So, but also really to live, to be able to live and enjoy. And um, she wanted the, the, the most dramatic um, uh, policies of her is to getting rid of more and more car lanes and adding more and more bicycle lanes. And the very famous street, Rue de Rivoli, next to the Tuileries Gardens, uh, because of her, right? So basically when we came out of the first lockdown, you see that there's originally like six bike, six car lanes. Now there's only one car lane for taxi and buses and the rest is all for bikes. And uh, so this is quite, uh, um, in tune, I would say, with the vision of Paris for the 2024 Olympics as well. So Paris win the Olympic uh, game uh, by its, its uh, promoting uh, green energy and sustainability and so on and so forth. And so I can't wait to see how Paris is going to evolve in the next few years with the restoration of the Notre Dame underway, with more and more bicycle lanes, more parks, more green, more clean energy added to the city under the leadership of Anne Hidalgo. You know, we're not forgetting all the rest of the women's contribution from history. And so, and um, yeah, I think especially for women like us, huh? so it will be really exciting to see and uh, and uh, remember and remember how um, how the life that we live today, all the, the 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 comfort, the liberty that we take today, wearing pants and uh, you know this right of speech, the right of uh, uh, like uh, ownership of your children, divorce, so on and so forth, the voting, all of that. And so it's all because uh, of um, the, the, the deeds of those women before us. So I hope I was able to, um, to just um, unravel some of these uh, uh, stories of the women that have, uh, that have been sort of uh, uh, ignored and um, give you a different perspective of Paris. Um, and uh, of course, there are hundreds and thousands more women uh, that's of course worthy of discussion as well right so but i today we wanted to, to just not pick on uh, feminists hardcore feminists or writers or authors but really just to see how women from all walks of uh, life just by being true to themselves and how they're able to change friends and make paris the city it is today. So thank you so much. I see some of your comments coming in uh, from Pat and from Vicky and Amy and uh, Lynn. Thank you so much. Um, uh, just before you guys logging off, I just want to say thank you very much for supporting us. Uh, my husband Farid and I have launched this page in our activity, um, hoping to really keep your dream alive and keep sharing our passion. And for the next two weeks, we have more program planned. Next week, our guide friend Will is going to be uh, again going live on the streets of Paris of Latin Quarter. She's going to be following the footsteps of Hemingway and show you, well, you know, st those stories of this golden uh, Paris in the 1920s. And then the week after that, it will be me again uh, here on the Zoom webinar sharing Monet and his life and his uh, gardens at Giverny. So uh, our events are constantly added onto our Facebook page, Paris and Beyond Tours. Uh, we always broadcast these events as well on YouTube. If you're not able to attend live, make sure to go back, like our YouTube page, subscribe to it, and, uh, and watch anytime at your comfort. 
So thank you again for coming. And if you wish to support us, um, which without your support, we would not be able to uh, continue. And here, uh, we greatly appreciate your tips, your donation. And if there's anything that you would like to hear, to see a topic, uh, of an artist, feel free also to write us an email at parisandbeyondtours at gmail.com um, that we would be happy to, you know, to, to, to think of a presentation or a tour. So, um, so yeah, that's it for me today. And if you have any questions, yes, of course, Lynn, thank you for the reminder of crepes. Ferret tomorrow is going to, making, to be making the delicious crepes with you as well. So make sure to join us tomorrow on Facebook Live, uh, 6 p.m. Paris time, how to make the delicious crepes. Let me see. Um, thank you again, Lauren, Deb, Elma, Tamara, Mark, uh, Ellen, and uh, yes, oh, Koki, thank you so much for your generous donation last time on Walmart. David, Mona, Lisa, uh, did I miss anyone? No. Well, thank you again. And uh, if you have no more questions, I will see you maybe tomorrow or next time. Au revoir.